Hi, this is Michael Altos. We're continuing our discussion of clinical pharmacology of inhalational anesthetics. This is recording part two. Now we're going to talk about all of the volatile anesthetics. The first is halothane. Halothane is not really used in the United States anymore, although you may see it in some other countries, especially if you go to do charitable work in a disadvantaged location. And halothane still may show up on some board exams. Halothane is cheap, it's safe, it's sweet and non-pungent, which makes it excellent for mask induction, for example, in children. Halothane is a myocardial depressant. It decreases blood pressure and cardiac output by up to 50%. Also, it has effects on the electrical system. It slows conduction and it sensitizes patients to catecholamines. So any patient who has an increase in catecholamines or is getting epinephrine, you may want to choose something other than halothane. In the lungs, it increases respiratory rate and decreases tidal volume, thus decreasing minute ventilation. It decreases your hypercapnic drive. And like all of the volatile anesthetics, that's everything except nitrous, it is a potent bronchodilator. Halothane blunts cerebral autoregulation, which means that the ability to maintain cerebral blood flow, regardless of blood pressure, that ability is lost and therefore patients who are hypotensive will have lower uh, cerebral perfusion and patients who are hypertensive will have higher. It's also a vasodilator, which will therefore increase cerebral blood flow. The texts recommend that patients who are going to get halothane should be hyperventilated before starting halothane. Otherwise, they will get this cerebral blood flow increase from vasodilation and the brain will swell. In the neuromuscular department, halothane does cause some muscle relaxation and it potentiates the neuromuscular blockade. It also triggers malignant hyperthermia. <clears throat> halothane decreases renal blood flow, uh, GFR, and urine output, partially due to that decrease in cardiac output that we described earlier. One of the most notable pearls about halothane is its effect in the liver. We know that in general, like many anesthetics, and especially those that drop cardiac output, we'll see a decrease in hepatic blood flow. We also see an impaired hepatic clearance of other drugs as a result of this. Now, halothane is oxidated in the liver into trifluoroacetic acid, and about 20% of the halothane is not exhaled but is metabolized in the liver. One in five adults who get halothane de develop some mild hepatotoxicity which manifests as leth lethargy, nausea, and fever, and is probably due to that decrease in hepatic blood flow. But some patients, although it is rare, would get halothane hepatitis, which is a massive hepatic necrosis and could even lead to death. This is probably some sort of an immune mechanism, and this is not really something we see anymore, but again, you may see it on uh, board exams still. Halothane hepatitis. So what are the main contraindications to halothane? Well, anyone who had liver dysfunction after prior exposure to halothane, patients who have intracranial hypertension, patients with pheochromocytoma or severe cardiac disease because of the decrease in cardiac output, and then patients who are on beta blockers or calcium channel blockers because of their cardiac depression, or patients on aminophilin or theophylline because of the risk of arrhythmias. I would probably add to this list just like a pheochromocytoma, patients on an epinephrine infusion may benefit from some other inhalational anesthetic. The next drug is sevoflurane, also non-pungent, like halothane, but much lower solubility. It is the drug of choice for inhalation induction in this country. Sevoflurane, because of its low solubility, has a very fast emergence. So fast that we actually see some post-op delirium, especially in children, and some think this is due to the rapid emergence from anesthesia. In the cardiac department, sevoflurane really causes minimal changes in contractility and heart rate. Like the others, it causes an increase in respiratory rate and a decreased tidal volume, thus decreasing minute ventilation. It blunts the hypoxic and hypercapnic drives, and like the other inhalational volatile anesthetics, it's a bronchodilator. It increases cerebral blood flow and ICP, but unlike halothane, this will respond to hyperventilation. So by increasing tidal volume and respiratory rate, we can drop the CO2 and therefore decrease cerebral blood flow. 
It also decreases cerebral metabolic rate. It does have some element of muscle relaxation, and in fact, if you do a mask induction with uh, sevoflurane and get the child deep enough, you could probably intubate them without any uh, neuromuscular blocking agents. It potentiates the neuromuscular blocking agents that you do give, and it is a trigger of malignant hyperthermia. It causes a sleep, slight decrease in renal blood flow, and as we'll discuss in the next slide or two, it causes formation of compound A. In the liver, it causes no significant changes. It's eliminated primarily by exhalation. Only about 5% is metabolized in the liver. There is formation of fluoride ion, which could theoretically cause nephrotoxicity, but nobody has described this clinically in humans. The most important pearl about sevoflurane's side effects is probably the formation of compound A. This happens when, when sevoflurane is exposed to the CO2 absorber, specifically um, barolime or sodalime, and compound A is nephrotoxic in rats. And as you use lower fresh gas flows and temperatures inside the circuit increase, and you use higher concentrations of sevoflurane and a longer case, we see more and more compound A formation. Now, there is no evidence of renal injury in humans from compound A. They've seen some increased protein in the urine, but no evidence of renal injury. Nevertheless, some official recommendations were made, despite the lack of data to support it, that if you're using sevoflurane, you should use fresh gas flows of at least two liters per minute if the exposure will exceed two mac hour, which means two mac for an hour, or one mac for two hours, or half a mac for four hours, and that you should never go below one liter per minute total fresh gas flow. This shouldn't really be an issue for many of you because the newer CO2 absorbers don't form compound A when they are exposed to sevoflurane. Finally, uh, carbon monoxide, which we'll see as a byproduct of some other volatile anesthetics, is not considered to be a big issue with sevoflurane. There really are not any unique contraindications to the use of sevoflurane, which is one of the reasons it's so popular. Isoflurane also has minimal cardiac depression. It does have a little bit of increase in heart rate and maybe some coronary artery dilatation. In the lungs, it increases respiratory rate and decreases tidal volume, leading to a decrease in minute ventilation, blunts the hypoxic and hypercapnic drives. Now, we said that halothane and sevoflurane were bronchodilators. Isoflurane is also a bronchodilator, but it is irritating and pungent, which means it stinks and makes you cough when you breathe it. So it's not appropriate for inhalational induction. And you may see patients like asthmatic patients coughing or choking a little bit if they have a light plane of anesthesia. But I would not say that this drug is contraindicated in asthmatics. And if a patient develops bronchospasm during an anesthetic, you would want to deepen the anesthetic. Neuro, it increases cerebral blood flow and ICP, especially above one MAC, and it decreases cerebral metabolic um, consumption of oxygen. You can achieve EEG silence with isoflurane at about two MAC. Neuromuscular, it potentiates neuromuscular blockade and has some muscle relaxing properties of its own, and it triggers malignant hyperthermia. In the kidneys, it decreases renal blood flow, GFR, and urine output. It does cause some decreased hepatic blood flow, but not as significant as with halothane. Isoflurane does have some metabolism to trifluoroacetic acid, and we do see some increased fluoride levels, but again, nephrotoxicity is unlikely. There really are not any major contraindications to isoflurane. Desflurane is very similar to isoflurane in structure, but it's much less soluble and much less potent. When we talk about expense, desflurane is the most expensive, then sevoflurane, and they are both much more expensive than isoflurane, which is cheap. Desflurane is unique because of its very high vapor pressure, which means it's going to need a special vaporizer. You see, desflurane can boil at room temperature, especially at higher altitudes, and changes in temperature or altitude could really affect the concentration of the delivered agent using our traditional vaporizers. So for this reason, we use a special vaporizer, and it heats desflurane to a hot gas and then blends it with 
the fresh gas flow that comes in through the vaporizer. Similar to sevoflurane, we do see fast emergence with desflurane because of its um, low solubility and maybe some post-op delirium, again, especially in children. Desflurane, when it's turned on, can cause a transient tachycardia and hypertension. Some recommend turning it on gradually to minimize this effect. There's no change in coronary blood flow with desflurane. As with the other volatile agents, it increases respiratory rate but decreases tidal volume, thus decreasing minute ventilation, and blocks the hypoxic and hypercapnic drives. Similar to isoflurane, it is a bronchodilator but is irritant and pungent. And the pungency is such that it can lead to salivation, breath holding, coughing, and even laryngospasm. This is probably most severe in children. It's not recommended to be used for inhalation induction. I believe that when they first started using desflurane, they called it deathflurane because of the laryngospasm they saw in so many children. This shouldn't be as much of an issue with IV induction and then turning on the desflurane. But if there's one drug that I would consider avoiding in an asthmatic, maybe I would avoid desflurane in a severe asthmatic because of my concern of how, they, how their airway might be irritated during emergence from anesthesia as they get lighter. But I would not say it's a contraindication. In the neuro uh, department, we see increase in cerebral blood flow and ICP, but again, responds to hyperventilation and decrease in cerebral metabolic oxygen consumption. It does have some muscle relaxation properties and potentiates neuromuscular blockade, and desflurane does trigger malignant hyperthermia. No significant effects in the kidneys or liver. It is not significantly metabolized and is pretty much 100% exhaled. In a desiccated CO2 absorbent, we can get carbon monoxide. This was an issue with older absorbents that had to be kept hydrated. And if someone left their fresh gas flows on all weekend, you could have patients um, exposed to carbon monoxide on Monday morning when a desiccated CO2 absorbent came in contact with something like desflurane. This is probably not as much of a concern with more modern CO2 absorbers that may not form carbon monoxide. Again, no unique contraindications except maybe in a severe asthmatic. This is a good time to speak just for a moment about recovery from volatile anesthetics. That is, how quickly do people wake up? And desflurane obviously has the most favorable recovery profile because of its low solubility. So since it doesn't build up in the blood or the fat, there's not as much agent in the body. And it comes out of solution and into the lungs quickly. You may not notice much of an effect in the operating room, but where this effect is best appreciated is out of the OR in PACU. This graph shows how many hours of anesthesia a patient has had compared with how long did it take until they could respond to a command? And here, if a patient had two hours of anesthesia, and this is pretty high level of anesthesia, and desflurane, it took them about 10 minutes. Sevoflurane, it took them about 18 minutes. Um, as the anesthetic got longer, this difference increased. How long until they were oriented? Again, we see a similar curve shape. This graph shows how many minutes after responding to a command is the patient able to swallow an ounce of water without coughing or drooling? And we see the desflurane patients were able to do it within a couple minutes after, from the time they could first respond to command until they could achieve this task. Sevoflurane patients needed about 15 minutes before they could get to where the desflurane patients are. So in order to respond to command or be oriented, that might be a criteria to get out of the room. But really, to get out of the OR, they just need to breathe and sort of protect their airway minimally. Um, keep their airway open. But this swallowing without coughing is a lot more of a marker that's saying you're ready to leave PACU. So this is where we really see some benefits from desflurane is in the post-operative period. Just a couple more points on recovery from volatile anesthetics. Um, again, if all you need is a 60% decrease in, vo uh, local an in uh, inhalational anesthetic levels, you can see Des, SIBO, and ISO are all pretty similar. Again, this is how long the anesthetic was compared to 
the how many minutes it takes to drop by 60%. This is really context sensitive half time or context sensitive decrement time, except for inhalational drugs instead of IV infusions. You can see not much difference if you need a 60% decrement, but as we go to 80%, 90%, 92%, now you can really see a big difference between ISO, SIVO, and DES. And the question is, well, which one of these is clinically significant? Well, some say that you may need more than 90% elimination of anesthetic in order to restore normal pharyngeal reflexes. That means being able to manage your secretions, swallow and eat without aspirating. So again, we see that getting out of the operating room, there may not be a big difference in these three drugs, but being ready for discharge, there may be a big difference, especially for longer cases. Finally, we should mention xenon, which is not in common clinical practice, but is still being studied. Uh, xenon is literally just xenon, the inert gas. It's very cardiovascular stable. It's very insoluble with a, a partition coefficient of 0.1 to 0.2. So you can get fast induction, you can do mask inductions, you get fast wake-ups, it doesn't trigger MH, it sounds like a wonderful drug. The only disadvantages are, first of all, it's very expensive, and actually you have to use a special anesthesia machine because all the xenon that the patient breathes out is saved and stored for the next patient, so it doesn't go to waste. It's also not very potent, so it has a MAC of about 70%, putting it somewhere in the range of nitrous oxide. So this can be a limitation as well if your patient needs more than 30% oxygen. Finally, here's a chart that I've created and put in the notes. And you may find charts like this to be helpful for you to create in order to learn about different classes of drugs anytime during this year. Uh, here I've taken all the different drugs and then a whole bunch of different variables and tried to plot out how each variable um, behaves with different drugs, so I can start to look for patterns. I can see how nitrous has different hemodynamic parameters than the rest of the drugs. I can see how halothane has different neurologic parameters than the rest, and so on. That's it for this recording here. As always, please do let me know if you have questions. You can email me, or we can talk about it in class, and we'll continue with the next recording.